King. Praise the Lord. Lord, tis for thee, for thy coming we wait. The grave, the, the sky, not the grave. And then it got mixed up there. The sky, not the grave, is our goal. I like the preacher. He says, we're not looking for a hole in the ground. We're looking for a hole in the sky. The Lord coming to catch away his saints and to take his people home. What a wonderful, wonderful doctrine we have this week. And I'll be dealing with that a little bit tomorrow night as we think about the rapture and its timing. When will the rapture take place? And I trust to bring before you nothing but the scriptures of truth. And I'll start in the book of Genesis as we think about the rapture. When will it take place? That's tomorrow evening and you're all of you very welcome to come. I do thank you so much for your welcome here in Kilkeel. You live in a beautiful place. It's a pity it rains every time I come here. It rained the last time I come, and I was taken around the harbour this afternoon. Nice to see you. Still a little bit of fishing going on here, across in Scotland where I was earlier in the year. I think it's nearly finished. But um, there we are. A lovely joy to be here, and thank you for coming this evening. When it was raining so hard, I thought there won't be many here, but it's lovely to see such a lovely crowd of people on a Monday night. We appreciate your coming, and thank you so much for your welcome. I count it a great honor to be among you. As a dear brother said, we had a lovely day yesterday. The Lord was among us, and we did know much of his presence. And we pray that that will continue right through the week. Um, there is a leaflet with the different subjects on. Uh, and at the end, uh, maybe tomorrow, not tonight, perhaps the subject won't lend it to that. But tomorrow, perhaps we could just have a, I'll finish a wee bit early and you can, if you have any questions you want to ask, um, you, you're welcome to ask questions. I don't know all the answers you know. My name isn't Solomon. That's uh, Alec, but you, there may be time for a few questions uh, tomorrow evening, as particularly we think of the catching away, the caught up, the harpezo of the church. It is the church's glorious hope. It is our blessed future, and it's coming. And it may not be long off, long away, before our Lord shall come. Friends here in Kilkil this evening, it's becoming more and more credible to think maybe we're living just before he comes. Everything points to the lateness of the hour, as we were thinking last night. So do come all you can uh, and join us. Now, just a few things before we open the scriptures and read. Uh, first of all, I have some books and DVDs of various kinds. As you leave on the left-hand side, all right, and do have a look and a browse through there. And I'm delighted to announce that since I came to Kilkeel, I've found uh, a sales uh, assistant, James, and he's cool, and he will serve you there. This is so that I can talk to people like you, and I, I won't be tied up. James is very good. Everything is marked. All the prices are on things, and I, I'm so grateful to young James. Um, he's sharp, and he'll see to you there and take your money from you. All right. On the bookstall tonight, a brand new book, just off the press from John Ritchie and Kilmarnock. Uh, that book is a real challenge of information. Israel, the church, and Islam, past, present, and future. Uh, Major Donald Cameron was in the Highland Regiment, he's a Scot, and during the war years, he worked for the government in translation. He speaks fluent Russian, I think French and English is a brilliant, he was in a, an academic and he has written this very fine book, Israel, the Church and Islam. Now he worked in Islamic societies during the war, I think it was in North Africa. He's a very, very knowledgeable man and he's just completed this book. He's written quite a few others and this one he asked me very kind of him to write a foreword to it, which has also been printed in a number of magazines. You can get that on the bookstall tonight. It's a thrilling book to read and lots of really good up-to-date information in it. And then uh, I have here this evening copies of uh, messages which I gave at the Bournemouth Convention of the Prophetic Witness Movement, not this year, but last year. On these three
three DVDs, you'll have uh, overheads, which I use, and you'll have me on it. I'm sorry you're going to look at an old man like me on your television, but if you can get one, I spoke seven times each, each evening once, waiting for God's Son from heaven, the believer's past, present, and future, and what does it mean to be waiting for God's Son from heaven? And the day the church goes home, a little bit like we should be thinking tomorrow night, the believer's unimaginable future, and why will the dead in Christ rise first? All of the messages I gave are about 50 minutes each, and the, all seven of them are here. A very important one is number three, the more sure word of prophecy. The Bible, God's written revelation. We have to be Bible Christians, given by divine inspiration, and the Word of God and its place in our lives. And number four, God has a controversy with the nations. And I dealt with Israel's future, Israel's present, and God's plan for His ancient people. And number five, that, the people are interested in that, the divine restrainer and the man of sin. 2 Thessalonians 2, a most intriguing study. That's on there. The throne rights of Jesus Christ. That's his millennial coming, millennial reign. And last of all, when I see him, I shall be like him. I'm sorry, I'd love to be Father Christmas and give you all one, but I can't do that. They're 11 pounds, and they're on the bookstall. And uh, young James, he will serve you after the meeting. If you haven't got the money tonight, you can take what you like and pay tomorrow. Uh, if you haven't got any money at all, I'll have to think about it, all right. <laughs> but uh, James will see there. And the, you know, that's a great little leaflet. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, the restoration and conversion of the Jews. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Dale Moody, uh, Horatio Bonner, um, all of those great men, they believed and preached classical, premillennial, dispensational truth as we hold to it. And uh, it's very refreshing to read Spurgeon here and to, to know that he preached exactly what we will hear and meet from the Word of God during this week. Those are there, uh, there a pound, I think, a very helpful little leaflet written by the uh, Mr. Spurgeon himself. Well, uh, just before, I nearly forgot, um, I work in the UK mainly, but I also visit Eastern Europe, where I set up uh, a UK-based charity a few years back. We send blankets and help, but mostly the Word of God. I go to Romania several times a year, and God willing, I'll be there in January at the Bible School, right in the middle of Romania. Perhaps you know Romania is a very large country, and Sibiu is right in the middle there. And there's a little Bible School, well, a little one, it's a big one, three stories, and every January I go to speak with two other bro brothers in the Open Brethren Bible College, a hundred marvelous young men will gather there as they do year by year. The students are asked to contribute what they can toward their accommodation. It's residential all the week, uh, and I always undertake by faith before the Lord to raise the, the money, uh, 3,000 pounds for their meals, the laundry and the electricity and so on. It's a faith venture, it's the Bible school. And there we are, I think it was last year, you'll see some of those lovely young students. They, they help too. They're absolutely out and out for the Lord. And I had an email before I came away from home from a young couple who are going from Romania to India to serve the Lord there. Maybe you have Romanian pastors here in the north of England. They, they just want to give the gospel out. Uh, you can get that leaflet this evening. Uh, please do help yourselves. Well, let's turn to God's Word, shall we? And this evening we're going to turn to the Old Testament Scriptures and to one friends of the Hebrew prophets. Ezekiel chapter 38. And will you turn to it, please? Bless you in the Word of God. Ezekiel 38, reading from verse 1. Interesting that Ezekiel 38 follows, of course, Ezekiel 37 and the remarkable prophecy of the dry bones and the two stages of Israel's future restoration, restored first to the land in unbelief, later restored to the Lord by a miraculous outpouring 
of the Holy Spirit upon them, the latter rain. And in chapter 38, we have a very remarkable prophecy. When you found it, friends, just look up for one minute. The only authority we have as Christian believers and followers of the Lamb, the only authority we have for anything is this book, the Word of God. We have no other authority for believing anything. And uh, that great bishop of Liverpool, the first one, J.C. Ryle, he had a number of wonderful sayings, and he used to say, apart from the God of the Bible, there is no God. He's the only one. The God who's revealed himself, the Bible is God's written revelation, he was the incarnate revelation of God, but the only God there is, is the God who is in this Bible. And Christ is in all the scriptures. And this evening we're turning then to Ezekiel 38. Thank you so much. The word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. So here is the Lord taking up a position of opposition and judgment to a nation. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. We will find out shortly what these names mean. And I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws, and will bring thee forth all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor even great, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. We pause for just a moment. This, uh, the weapons here, Ezekiel would have no concept of modern weapons of war or mass destruction. So we may understand that he wrote what he could see and what he understood in his time. But here is a war uh, conducted by people with weapons. Persia, Ethiopia, verse 5, Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togomar of the north quarters and all his bands, and many people with thee, be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Now I want you to follow, brothers and sisters, carefully. After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years, or the end times, as a number of expressions used of the countdown period, that the Lord Jesus mentioned the tribulation, and thou shalt come back to the land that is brought back from the sword, and is gathered out of many people, a global diaspora, a nation regathered in the land in the last days. You will come against the mountains of Israel. We may safely assume the Golan and the north, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely. That's interesting. And not safe tonight, all of them. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm, and shall be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands, that is Gomer, and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, and having neither bars nor gates, a nation with no need of security. What an interesting scenario for Israel this, to take a spoil and to take a prey to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, that's the land brought back as it has been, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, a global diaspora, which have gotten cattle and goods and dwell in the midst of the land. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, all with the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take great spoil? Therefore, son of man, prophesy, say unto God, Thus saith the Lord God in that day, when my people Israel dwell dwelleth safely, 
Shall that you not, thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place. Note this, out of the north parts. This is a northern invasion. And many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be. He repeats himself, the prophet, in the latter days. I will bring thee against my land. Did you see in that verse, my people, my land, that the heathen may know me when I am sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them. And it shall come to pass at that time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, my fury will come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there will be a great shaking in the land of Israel, the fishes of the sea and the fowls of heaven, the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth. And all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down. Earthquakes and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him and is against Gog throughout all the mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will plead against him with pestilence and blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands, and upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify and sanctify myself. And here's a wonderful conclusion to this great and dramatic chapter. I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Well, may God bless that great end time drama to our understanding. <laughs> Dear brothers and sisters, our subject this evening, resurgent Russia. Resurgent Russia, Islam, and the coming war. Who would ever dream as we see our world today, of the world's number one atheist society and nation, Russia, there are many Christians there, and churches there, missionaries serving there, of course, but it is still the world's, as we shall see, number one atheist nation would join hands with the world's most religious nation, Shiite Islam. We will come to it in a moment as we think of resurgent Russia. Islam. What an awkward connection there. We'll be surprised as we look into the Word of God tonight and the coming war. Now last evening we were in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 24. And in that chapter we saw, is it verse uh, 23? Behold the fig tree and all the trees. Watch, behold, watch that nation, Israel. Behold the fig tree. The, the budding fig tree, budding back into life in the, last sen in, the, in the century before last and in the last century, budding back into life. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. Now why did the Lord Jesus instruct us to behold all the trees? Well, many of you will know already that God on planet Earth is working out a great and glorious plan for the people of the world. The church of Jesus Christ, we'll think about that tomorrow, the future of the church. For the Jewish people, their future, perhaps on Wednesday, we'll think about that and probe the scriptures concerning the future of God's earthly elect, his people Israel. And then he's got a plan for the nations, the unbelieving, God-defying nations of the earth. And make no mistake about it, friends, human history will end at the feet of Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. And that's why the Lord Jesus said, behold the fig tree and all the trees, because he's working out a mighty, transcendent plan that will bring the final kingdom of his love and of his grace to our rebel planet. Jesus Christ is Lord. Now this evening we're going to zero in 
on one of the trees that the Lord Jesus would have referred to, not by name, but by impl implication. And I want us to see in verses 1 and 3. If you're following in your Bible, you'll be interested perhaps to follow verses 1 to 3. Now, if you didn't bring a Bible with you, that's okay, just listen carefully. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog. Well, who or what is that? That's a funny name, Gog. I'm just glad my mom didn't call me that. That's all. The land of Magog. The land, Magog means the land of Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And prophesy against him and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Now then, let's ask three questions tonight of the scripture. Preachers here will know we call this diagnostic preaching. We're doing some diagnostics. We're asking what does the Bible mean here? And what does it mean there? And we're going to ask three diagnostic questions and probe the scriptures and find out what the Holy Spirit is saying to his church, to his people, and to the world in these tremendous days as we move on to the coming of the Lord. Now to find out who Gog and Magog are, we are in the hands of the, what we call the etymologists. You'll know perhaps some of you, most of you, that etymology is the study of the origins of people groups in the world. It's a very important study and a very wide study. Where did the nations of the world come from? I try hard never to use the word races because I'm of the persuasion that there's only one race, the human race. We're in different groups, different colors, cultures, but he made of one blood all the people to dwell upon the face of the earth. So what does etymology tell us about this? Well now, perhaps one of the greatest scholars of ancient Hebrew textual things was a scholar who's, who lived between 1786 and 1842. That's a long time ago. But his lexicon of the Greek and the Hebrew Bible is still a foundation work in universities and Christian colleges all over the world. His name, Gesenius. And some of you who study the scriptures will know that name, Gesenius. Perhaps the greatest scholar of the ancient Hebrew text and his uh, work was monumental and is still taught and held to today. That great scholar of the ancient world and ancient languages, he himself declared that the word, the name designation Gog, properly refers to a people known as Rosh. If you have a different translation of the Bible, I always preach from the King James Bible, but you may have a different translation with you which actually states Rosh. I used to notice as a young Christian in the, in the Amplified Bible, it was in there, Rosh. It refers to a head, the word Rosh. But Yesenia said it also refers to a large nation to the north of the Caucasus, and he submitted that this word, Rosh, comes as the root of what we now know as Russia. Russia. Now, the nation of Russia was not even in existence as a nation in Ezekiel's time. But through the timeless miracle of inspiration, the Holy Spirit looked forward in prophecy into the future, past the time of the church, the time of the Gentiles, into the future. And tonight the Hebrew prophet speaks to us of a great battle that lies ahead that will come from the north of Israel, seeking yet again to destroy the Jewish people. And it will come out of the north, we read, over the mountains of Israel. So the etymologists and others declare that this is Russia. For, furthermore, that great scholar Gesenius said that he believed from his studies that the name Meshech was an ancient tribal name from Moscow, very familiar to it, a dominant, the capital of, of uh, Russia, United, the Soviet state of Russia, and Tubal was Tobolsk, he said. And other scholars have agreed with him, 
comes from the world of etymology. And we find that this is teasing out the original meaning of these Bible names. Rush, Russia. So I believe, and, and I submit to you this evening, that this northern invasion, which must take place in the latter days, hasn't taken place in history yet, but it, it's designated for the latter years, when Israel will be in a great peace. Now all of this, friends, I hope we're going to get tonight. A time when Israel will, the, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, and the, some of the Palestinians, over a million of them that live among the Jewish people, live among the Israelis. I talk to them. They have all the same rights as the Jewish. They're not in any hurry to leave. And the media doesn't tell us about that. But in the future, there's going to come, in the last days, and I think that we can pinpoint this fairly clearly, there's going to come a great northern invasion which is linked up with a coalition of nations, the first of which is the leading Islamic nation in the world today. And we'll come to that in a moment. Now, Russia has taken for many centuries the dominant position of world atheism. As I've said to you, the nation as a nation did not exist in Ezekiel's time, but he prophesies about it in the last days. The doctrine of dialectical materialism, uh, communist socialism, gave to Russia the creed of socialism, built on the plank there is no God. And Russia's atheistic communism system, particularly on the days of Joseph Stalin, perhaps you've read, when Joseph Stalin, Stalin took Russia, uh, 20, uh, sorry, two million people died. Godlessness. A socialism that rules. Very big government. And what did Stalin say once he had conquered Russia? and put down all his enemies. That great leader, and certainly he was a very clever man, but a godless man and an atheist. He said, and I have his quotations here, Joseph Stalin said, we have deposed the czars of the earth. We will now dethrone the Lord of heaven. He was on a march for global politician, not a global domination, not just Ro Russia. We have deposed the czars of the earth, and we shall now dethrone the Lord of heaven. That was his game. And that still is Russia's game. Anti-Godism, anti-Semitism, anti-Christism, everything that God ordained. And then, friends, can you remember in the old days there was a, 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 a spaceship called the Sputnik? Do you remember that? Remember the Sputnik, a little spherical um, Russian spaceship that went into space. The first man in space was not an American, but a Russian. Do you remember that little round spherical thing going around the Earth, out of the Earth's orbit? And the little bleep bleep that it used to give out, we thought that was amazing. What amazing science and technology that a man in outer space was sending a message back to the earth. We were astonished. That, that was groundbreaking science, all right. I think I was still at school in, in the last year or two at school. We used to have a joke. When the Sputnik passed the moon, he said, I can't stop, I'm Russian. You got it. I'm trying to keep you all awake here tonight. And who was, the, who was the astronaut, a Russian, remember? Who was he in that little spacecraft? His name was Yuri Kagarin. Do you remember that? And this is what Yuri Kagarin said. Listen to this. I'm trying to teach you, show you tonight, this nation of Gog and Magog and Tubal. Listen. This is what he said. Our rocket has bypassed the moon. We are nearing the sun. The world listened with an astonishment. We have not discovered God. See. We have turned out the lights in heaven that no man will be able to put on again. The old lie that science proves that God doesn't exist. We are breaking the yoke of the gospel. Strange words for a Russian scientist and cosmonaut. We are breaking the yoke of the gospel, the opiate of the people. Let us go forth, he said, and Christ shall be relegated to mythology. 
That's what they're at, to dethrone the Lord of heaven. And the first nation on earth, the number one nation in that has been in the past, Russia. We don't know that that could change, but Russia has a special mission to dethrone the Lord of heaven and relegate Jesus Christ to mythology. That's, that's their open idea. And this uh, uh, passage, the Magog War, the Rosh War, will come out of the north, from Russia, over the hills of the north, over those famous hills in the north of Israel, over the mountains of Israel. Now here's another little thing. When you get home, you can't do it here, get a map of the Middle East in the back of your Bible. You'll find one that says, Palestine in the name of Christ. You know that's a nonsense, don't you, that the Lord Jesus never lived in a land called Palestine. That's not the inspired scripture, that's the, the cartographers have added that for our understanding. But they didn't understand that the land of Israel wasn't called Palestine until 132 years probably, or three, after the Lord Jesus was crucified, raised, and ascended back to heaven. When you get home, get a map of the Middle East, if it's only the one in the back of your map, that'll do, and put a ruler vertically like this on the map with Jerusalem on the left. A nice plastic, clear plastic ruler will, will help. And put your ruler on Jerusalem and lay it vertically up the line of longitude. North, like this, going up the map from Jerusalem Guess where the edge of that ruler will lead you? It will lead you within a few, very few degrees to Moscow itself. And thousands of years ago, the prophet, Je the prophet Ezekiel said, you will come out of your parts in the north, down over the mountains of Israel. I will know it, and when that happens, my fury will come up in my face. The Russian bear will make a fatal blunder. Now, Russia is a resurgent nation tonight. We thought that Russia was finished, a clapped out thing. Uh, communism, glasnost, perestroika. We thought that Russia was a, a finished thing. But you will know if you follow and behold the fig tree and all the trees, that Russia is moving at the moment west. Putin, he's a shrewd operator. He's a clever man, but he's at the head of this godless alliance that will come. The alliance which is being formed now, I'll show you very shortly about this alliance that Russia is, is building tonight. It'll be on your television this week. And what is happening is he's moved to Crimea, and next that, if I had time, I could read to you here from the reports that uh, Putin says he wants to invade Balkan, Baltic states, he wants to build the greater Russia back. And those satellite nations that were freed some years ago, you remember, he wants to get them back. And this is no vain boast because uh, the Russian military is being built up at an alarming rate. NATO and the Western world are alarmed. Russian military are working to create two new armies in the West, toward countries and hostility toward NATO increases. I'm reading from a report. The establishment of new military units will again cause concern for NATO, which has its own forces conducting US-led exercises on the eastern, uh, the alliance's eastern flank. Well, we all know that. But the Kremlin has a new fifth generation of what they call the Armata tank. Now, I've seen a picture of that. You can get it, the Armata tank. The Russians are building a, 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 an array of these top-range tanks. They reckon they can bust the, the American tanks. They are top technology. The Russians were always good in both world wars and are good now at that. And Putin says he wants to establish Moscow as a global military, military force, I'm quoting, on a par with the US. Now, friends, I'm not a politician, so you have to bear with me. I do my best to get my facts right. But the West, and Britain in particularly, particular, while Russia is building up her forces, we're scaling ours down. Did you know that we're having to borrow 
sailors to run the British Navy from France and Spain. Do you know that? I, I've checked the facts on this. We have so degraded and, and spent the money on everything but our national defense. You'll have read the, the leaders of the British Army and the Navy and so on warning the government. Two governments now. Danger. We're just at the bottom and we need to build up our defenses again. I think that we don't have a working aircraft carrier. Britain doesn't have one. The only one we've got, we share, I've tried to find out the truth about this, the only one we have, we share with France. And the planes are not yet fitted to fly from it. Now that wouldn't matter, but newspaper and television reports are that long-range Russian bombers are flying over the south coast of England. Did you know that? Flying over Bournemouth and up the coast of Sussex. Long-range Russian bombers. What, what's going on? Oh yes, and Russian ships too off the coast of Scotland penetrating into British national waters. What, what does Putin know? He knows that we're down and we're weak. He knows what he can do. And he's thinking good from his own point of view. Well now, what I want to come to is this. I'm not a politician. The Bible teaches me, here in this chapter and in other parts too, that that Russian bear, resurgent Russia, is going to make a bl fatal blunder when the Russian bear will fancy we will wipe out the Jews and we'll go to Israel and we will seize the fulcrum, the heart, of the world and we will conquer the Middle East. That will be the biggest blunder they ever made. And friends, if we could go back over the last war, we would see that uh, that happened there as well. Now I want you to look at verse four to verse six. Turn in your Bibles, Ezekiel 18, verse four to verse six. And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws. Fancy the Lord speaking to people like that. I'm going to put hooks in your jaws. But he's dealing with deadly enemies that hate him. And will bring thee forth all of thine army, horses, horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, and so on. A great army with bucklers and shields. All of them handling swords. Now, look what comes in verse 5. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Look, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togomar. Now we have only one, we have time to study just one of these ancient names for ancient worlds and civilizations. Here is an interesting thing, that in the Magog War, when Russia comes out of the north to destroy Israel and the Jewish people, the Lord's anger will come up in his face. But what I want to point out to you in verse 5 is that the first nation that will be in that alliance of nations is Persia. And lots of you will know what Persia is. It's the ancient name for modern Iran. This begins to fit a modern day picture as we think of Iran. Russia will create long-range nuclear bombs. He's doing it now. And for some years now, Iran has been refining uranium. So you perhaps know this as we behold the fig tree and all the trees. Russia has been busy refining uranium up to weapons grade. Why would a Shiite Muslim uh, a nation like Iran, what is it for? Oh, well, there's no secret about that. They've already said what it's for. It's to destroy Israel. Actually, they said to wipe Israel off the map and then destroy Israel, uh, America. And then they said they'd like to destroy you and me. They've also said, government of Iran, that well, they will export nuclear know-how to every terrorist group in the world. They want to dominate the globe ready to bring back, back the third imam. They too are waiting for a messiah. We are waiting for a messiah. They are waiting for another messiah. And they are determined. They know the time is short, as indeed it is. And they're, they're getting ready. Is this true? Well, we know it's true. 
because the government of Israel and the government of America have surveillance proof. They are watching what's going on. They see the personnel passing from Russia and the equipment and uh, the nuclear know-how that the Arabs don't have. They don't have the know-how to do it, but they know where to get it. And Russia is arming all of Israel's enemies tonight. The government of Israel has photographic proof that it, Russia is directing and supervising Iran's centrifuges. Now, I'm not a nuclear physicist, but they're centrifuge like this. And they're going day and night, I understand. You can get it on the web, and they're, they're refining this uranium up to weapons grade. And some of you will know that Mr. Um, President of America, Mr. Obama, has done what is probably, please, I'm not a politician, but it looks to be a very, very shaky deal with Iran. And they've released billions of dollars to give frozen in America back to the people, the, the government of, of Iran. Uh, guess what they're going to use the billions of dollars on? <laughs> no, no money for guessing that. And to proceed with their nuclear program. Can you imagine a nuclear armed Shiite Muslim Middle East power with projectiles? nuclear-headed that can reach London and New York and, of course, Jerusalem. What is going on as we behold the fig tree and all the trees? Well, what can we do about it? England can't shoot the bombers out of the sky going up our so southern coast. I don't know if they come over here, but they do o over where I live. What is the, let's ask of the scripture, when will this invasion take place? When will Magog war take place? When will they come? Well, this is very interesting. If you look in your scriptures, please, to um, verses... Uh, I have to find it here. Yes. When will, when will it be? I think you'll find there are eight indicators in scripture, diagnostic, we're looking at eight things that teach us when this will be. And if you look in the scriptures, you'll see it's when Israel is at peace. And I've lost my verse here, but it'll come to me in just a moment. Um, it's down there at verse 11. Thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest. Now that's interesting that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates to take a spoil, to take a prey, and so on. Now let's ask the question here. Whenever did the people gathered from many nations, we read in this prophecy, the people brought back from the sword, an alia of Jewish people from all over the world, at the moment about six, is it six or seven million of them, brought back from the sword, the people brought back from the sword. They've never had peace. There is no peace. Oh my, there's no peace in the land of Israel tonight. Knifing, talk of another intifada. There is no peace. They're surrounded with nations bent upon their utter destruction. And yet it says here that they will come. This nation, this invasion will take place when the nation of Israel will dwell at peace. Look, without walls, nor bars, nor gates, leave your house open. It's, it's no problem. We're a nation enjoying absolute peace. They've never had peace like this. Friends, this cannot be after the Lord returns. There won't be any wars when he's come back. So when will this peace be? Turn in your Bibles, will you, to Daniel chapter 8, and we'll find out. Not very far forward, the book of Daniel, prophecy of Daniel, and chapter 8, and we're at verse 23, please. Daniel 8 and 23. And verse 23 begins with a similar expression about the latter times. It really means the last days. There are a number of uh, titles given to the particular period of the last days in the latter time of their kingdom 
When the transgressors are come to the full, what an awful expression. A king of fierce countenance and dark, understanding dark sentences shall stand up. But this isn't God's king. This is the devil's prince, the, the Antichrist. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Stop there a moment. Do you remember Revelation 13? The dragon gave him his power and his seat. The coming world Antichrist will be a man. He comes up out of the sea of humanity. His number 666, we read, is the number of a man. He's just born a man like you men, me. Ah, but he will be a man indwelt with occultic intelligence and, and, and satanic power. He will hold the allegiance of all the people of the world. And the people who live rejecting Jesus Christ will follow the devil's Christ. According to the scriptures, his power will be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. He shall magnify himself in his heart. Yes, this is, this is the man, this is the coming world, super politician. We read about him just the same in other scriptures. Look. And by peace, he shall destroy many. By peace, he shall also stand up against the prince of princes. That's the Lord Jesus at the battle of Armageddon. But he shall be broken without hand. He will not be defeated by weapons of mass destruction. He'll be defeated by the brightness of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. How wonderful to know that in the end, Jesus will win. And that you, if you're, you're his and you're saved and redeemed by his blood, you too will win. No one can win who doesn't belong to Jesus Christ. But he shall be broken without hand. Note in the middle of that verse, by peace, he shall destroy many. Now we need another night here. But I'll hurry. The coming man of sin will be a super statesman politician. The world will not only admire him, Revelation 13 says, the whole world will worship him. But it says they, they who do that, their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. There's a little thought. Specifically stated, the ones who worship the beast on the earth during that time when he is revealed are the ones whose names were not written in the Lamb's book of life, Revelation 13. Now, this man is going to bring in, by a policy of peace, a world government, a world banking system, a world money supply, a world church. We have to be careful not to be a part of it. It's another night we need on that. We won't be doing it this week. He's going to bring in a global everything. And he's going to perform a work of global statesmanship that Obama and Putin and Cameron, if they could do that, they would really be big men on the world scene. The Antichrist will make peace between the Jew and the Arab. A peace that will be false. And for three and a half years, the Jewish people will receive him. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we haven't time, but in 2 Thessalonians 2, he will sit in a rebuilt Jewish temple. And say, Brother Passmore, you're talking nonsense. They haven't got a temple. Well, that's right, but they're getting it ready. They're getting it ready. Perhaps some of you have been in fanaticism, unbelief. They don't know the Lord. But they've got the priest's vestments, according to the book of Leviticus, and some of the furniture for the, that. Uh, that certainly the, the, the golden menorah is ready, I've seen. And the instruments for worship, yes. 2 Thessalonians 2 says that they must build a temple sometime fairly soon. And in that temple, the beast will deify himself three and a half years into the seven years that we had not time for. But in the book of Daniel, the 70th years of Daniel's 77s. Yeah, I don't think years comes into it. It's sevens. Shavua, sevens. And three and a half years into that tribulation time, the beast, having made peace, will then destroy, seek to destroy the Jewish people. The Lord Jesus says, when you see that happen, when he commits the abomination of desolation, spoken of, we looked last night, by, the Dan by, prophet, by Daniel the prophet, 
flee to the mountains. And we know where they will go in southern Jordan. It's there. It's a place to hide millions of Jewish people fleeing from the campaign of Armageddon and from the cruelty and the destruction of the beast. But if we read the book of Zechariah, we have time tonight, you'll find a, an awful fact that two-thirds of the Jewish people will perish in those days, but a third will be brought through and will be brought to know the Messiah and the nation will be reborn in a day. They will turn to the Lord and be born. So who is this nation? I, I, I would say tonight we're looking at a nation north of Israel. There it is, Russia. It will come down over the mountains of Israel, come in the latter days. It will be linked up with Islam. How intriguing that atheism and Islam could join. But it's happening before our eyes. We're seeing it happen on our TV screens. Iran. And we haven't time to look at the other names designated there by the prophet Ezekiel. But many are pointing out that Togomar refers to the European, na the nations of Europe, the European Union. Now we haven't time to go into it. You have to study Remember I taught you the word, etymology. It's the study of the origins of uh, people groups and nations in our world. Let's ask in closing, you've been so kind in your attention, when will this blunder take part? Well, it says, Ezekiel 38, verse 21, And I will call for a sword against him, Throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God, every man's sword shall be against his, his brother, and I will plead against him with pestilence and blood. But look back at verse 18. It shall come to pass at that same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury will come up in my face, for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there will be a great shaking, shaking in the land of Israel. Here is the Lord dealing with the great enemy of socialism, anti-Godism, dialectical materialism. There is no God. Anti-Godism. Headed up by Russia. And the Lord will deal with it at that time. And if you look forward to Ezekiel 39 and verse 11, what, what gruesome verses these are, friends, brothers and sisters here tonight. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of passengers on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noses of the, passenger, of the passengers and his people passing through that area will, have, will know the stench of flesh and there they shall bury Gog and all his multitude and they shall call it the valley of Hamon Gog but look at verse 12 in seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them that they may cleanse the land friends Hatred of God is futile. Those who are against Israel's God cannot win. And how wonderful that God is working out a great plan that one day will bring all the nations and Russia to holy judgment and retribution. And we read at the end of Ezekiel 38, thus, in this way, I will be sanctified in the sight of the nations and many nations will know that I am God. What a day that will be when beyond those first years and the second years, second three and a half years, it must be literal. The other years were literally fulfilled. The other 69 were fulfilled in human history, Jewish history, including the crucifixion of our Lord cut off, but not for himself, Daniel says. It was all written. The 69 years were fulfilled literally. The 70th year must be fulfilled literally. But the 70th year is yet for the future, and God is in control of human history. What a wonderful thing tonight, dear brothers and sisters, to know that the troubled course of human history, we watch snippets of it on our television screens. I'm so glad tonight that the troubled course of human history is not in the hands of mere men. Putin, 
Obama, all the rest of them. My Bible tells me the troubled course of human history is in the hands of Jesus Christ. And they're nail, they nail pierced. And he loves the world. And he died to save the world. But the world will move on to Armageddon. Tomorrow night we shall see how we are saved from the wrath to come. Not because we should be or we deserve to be. And say, well, don't we deserve to go through that time? Well, I guess so. Yeah, we do. If I got my deserts, I guess God would send me to hell. But Calvary has wrought a mighty work for me. And my sins are gone. And I'm a pardoned sinner. My destiny is not the Antichrist or the Day of Judgment. My destiny is glory, not the grave. One day soon, the Lord will come to take his waiting people home. And we're going to meet him, friends, in the air. I hope you know about this, and I hope you're looking forward to this. It's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. One second will be here, and another split second, you'll have to come tomorrow night. That's what it's all about tomorrow. Or uh, trying to whet your appetite. To my, that we, we, we will be taken up to be with the Lord. And some of you heard me say, I finished, please. You've been so good. Listen, I was preaching about the rapture once, and this dear lady at the door, she said, Oh, Mr. Passmore, I've not enjoyed your sermon tonight. What you preached about that we're going to meet the Lord Jesus in the air, that's not a blessed hope. You said it's a felicitous. Blessed means happy or felicitous. That's not a blessed hope for me. That's a terrible thing. I said, why should the rapture, being called up to meet the Lord, be a terrible thing? Well, she says, I have a phobia of heights. In fact, when the bulb went in the kitchen, I can't get up on a chair. I've got to get the neighbors in to put a new bulb in. I can't stand heights. I can't put a new bulb in in the kitchen. And you're telling me we're going to go up. The Christians are going to go up and meet the Lord. That's not a blessed hope for me. You know, the poor preacher, we have to pray for wisdom sometimes at the church door. And we pray it'll come fast, and it doesn't always come. It doesn't always come to me, but praise God, I got it that night. I took her two hands. She is a lovely Christian lady. I could see she was all right to talk to. I said, dear sister, I think this is the answer to your problem of your phobia and your fear of heights. One glimpse of the man who died for you, and all your fears and phobias will be gone. And she said, hallelujah. And she came back the next night. I thought it lost her. <laughs> she came back. Friends, the gray, the sky is not the grave, is our goal. Thank you for listening. And how wonderful to know that the Lord is in control. We sing our last hymn. It's